Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Agenda IDS. I am Patricia Porto, the Academic Coordinator of Denema Zimazan Institute. Agenda IDS is an online event in which we address important talks regarding intellectual property, law, and technology. I always invite experts on the subject to share the experience with us. And those who miss the live event will be able to access the record content available later on Dunaman Simpson Institute website. And today we will discuss aspects related to proving trademark use in order to maintain the trademark registrations. This is a very relevant topic in trademark that will be discussed by three experts on the subject from the perspective of China, Europe Union, and Brazil's regulations. And now please let me introduce our guests. To talk about the issue under China regulation, we invite Ms. Lena Shen. Welcome, Lena. Thank Lena you. is a lawyer. Welcome. Lena is a lawyer and a trademark attorney specialized in trademark persecution and IP enforcement in China. She's a senior partner of the Kun IP law firm in China and a bureau member of IPPI. And to discuss the matter as regulated in European Union, we invited Claudia Bach Morinska. Welcome, Claudia. Good morning. Claudia is a lawyer, a patent attorney, and a European trademark design attorney. Specialized in intellectual and industrial property law, copyright, and regulations dealing with unfair competition practice. She's a partner at Zamborski Morinsk Law Office in Poland and board member of IPPI. And to moderate the event and talking about the subject from the Brazilian perspective, we invited Rafael Atab. Welcome, Rafael. Thank you, Patricia. Morning. Morning. Rafael is a lawyer and a trademark attorney. He's a partner at Denman Simonson, member of the Denman Simonson Institute Advisory Board and IPPI board member. His practice focuses on strategic management of intellectual property rights portfolio with a particular dedication to complex matter in trademark fields. I would like to thank very much our guests for being here with us today. And now I will give the floor to Rafael. Thank you very much. Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much for uh, organizing this event. And a special thank you for uh, to Lina and Claudia to uh, joining us today to discuss about this very interesting topic. Uh, and I say it's very interesting, very current for two main reasons, because first, it was the subject of a resolution from AAPPI uh, just last year, proving trademark use. Uh, and I guess most people know about AAPPI. AAPPI is one of the most traditional uh, IP uh, associations uh, in the world with almost uh, 9,000 members all from all, uh, all over the globe. And uh, we discuss a lot on subject matters regarding IP. And every year, we uh, the members propose four topics to be discussed and potentially to become a resolution. And trademark use last year was one of them. Uh, and by coincidence, Last year, uh, the, the Brazilian Patent and Trademark Office also implemented uh, a new regulation on uh, non-use cancellation actions and uh, actually changed some quite long-standing uh, approaches and standards when it came to, uh, to proving trademark use. Uh, and I would cite right now two of the these aspects and during the uh the the entire uh webinar we'll also learn a little bit about other ones but uh the first one was that and as you might know 
Brazil has a, uh, a five-year grace period for the start of using. After five-year registrations, any third party uh, may initiate non-use cancellation actions. So one of the one of the big changes was treating these initial five years as a really grace period where uh, use cannot just need to be started and not proven all the way long. And, uh, and another aspect was for the first time, the BP2 addressed online evidence of use. So these are some of the issues that are being going to be discussed today. And I'm uh, very grateful that I hear, that I see right now a very international audience, not only our traditional Brazilian audience in these uh, EDS, uh, IDS uh, events, but also people from other uh, countries as well, probably interested about China, Europe, and Brazilian experiences. And so as I'm also very uh, keen on understanding a little bit more what happens in China and in Europe, I think we can start listening a little bit about it from our guests today. And uh, I would start by asking, uh, and let's start with you, Lina. How is it uh, that China uh, regulates, from a broader perspective, uh, non-use cancellation actions? Is there a grace period? Uh, how does it work uh, in China? How many years for you to start to need to start using the mark? And how does it work in practice? And we are here about talking about practice uh, when it comes to someone challenging another person's registration based on non-use. Thank you, Lina. Yeah, sure, Rafael. Uh, glad to make some introduction of the overview picture of the use requirements in China. Well, only when I prepare for this uh, webinar, I realized that our three-year grace period is is different from the grace period in, in Europe or in Brazil, probably. Uh, in the Chinese law, it said that uh, any trademark may be canceled if it uh, stopped using for continuously three years from registration. It means that for the first uh, uh, three years, you also need to use, actually, if you stop using uh, even in the first three years continuously, you will uh, have the risk of being canceled. I mean, the trademark. Uh, basically, China is a first to file country, so the use requirement is not uh, uh, as like in the US. Uh, so we do not require the use before uh, filing an application or before being registered. Uh, not even intention to use. Uh, so in this respect, it's it's uh, 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 close to the European practice. Uh, but uh, according to the current Chinese trademark law, in principle, the trademark application should be filed for the purpose of use. And uh, after 19, uh, 2019, uh, amendment of the trademark law, uh, Article 4 of the, uh, the law uh, uh, says that application for the trademark registration that is malicious and not filed for the purpose of use should be refused. That means the examiner can challenge it, actually. If they, sus if they are suspicious, you are filing the trademark not for uh, actual use. Uh, for instance, you, they, they probably uh, suspect you file the application to register trademark for sale of the trademark per se, then they may have the right to invite you to uh, provide use evidence or evidence or to prove the intention of use uh, during the examination. It happens already a lot, especially in the recent years, especially when the applicant file a big amount of applications in short period of time. It happens to many big uh, internet companies because they often file like hundreds of trademarks one time or in a short period of time. So one really a top uh, uh, internet company in China received many and they 
complained a lot of this practice, but uh, they need to reply uh, by submitting evidence if, if they cannot prove uh, the actual use or, or, or intention to use, then the trademark will be refused. I see saying that uh, um, basically uh, you will receive the registration certificate without uh, proving any use. It's only when a third party start a non-use cancellation application, you will need to uh, prove uh, your trademark use. Uh, it is three year period different from the five year period uh, like in Brazil and, uh, and in, in Europe. So we always advise the clients to start uh, using the trademark within the first to three years after registration. Otherwise, it will be a risk to lose it if somebody uh, starts the cancellation proceeding. So that's the, the, the basic and uh, 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 overall picture of the non-use cancellation or the, the, the use requirement in China. Well, thank you, Lina. I think that's very interesting because uh, when you file in China, even though it's a first-to-file country, you also need to be attentive of uh, acting in good faith and avoiding anything that might uh, indicate that you're not actually uh, going to use the mark, but actually just filing it for protective or defensive uh, methods or something like that. But Claudia, what happens in Europe? Uh, how uh, Do you also have a grace period uh, similar to Brazil or is it different, more uh, similar to China and uh, particularly one question that I have is, do you need to initiate a separate non-use cancellation action or can it but just be argued in another procedure? Uh, okay, thank you, Rafael. Thank you for having me here, for inviting me. And referring to Linas, uh, in spite of this three years term is in line with TRIPS, I think that uh, the, our clients more uh, would like to have these five years that we have in Europe, you know, because it's always two years plus to start uh, start business, to start uh, the preparation to using a trademark. So uh, in Europe, if within a period of five years following the registration, the trademark holder is not using the trademark in uh, European Euro uh, Europe in connection with goods and services for it, for which it was registered, um, or such use has been suspended for an interrupted period of five years, uh, such trademark will be subject to the, uh, to the sanction provided by the trademark regulation unless there are proper reasons for non-use. And what are these uh, sanctions? One of the sanctions is the cancellation due to, to non-use, uh, as you mentioned, but other sanction is... Um, that such trademark cannot be effectively used in a pending proceedings because uh, the other party may ask for the proof of use and if such proof of use is not provided then the cancellation or opposition will be simply rejected. Uh, you asked if the cancellation proceeding uh, may be started just before the office or in the other proceedings. So uh, you can start the um, uh, the cancellation proceeding in administrative proceeding before the office, and then you are obliged to file a separate uh, cancellation uh, motion. We, we call it revocation motion. And then you have to just uh, put the statement that the trademark is not used within the, uh, within the uninterrupted period of five years, and that's all. And the other party, the trademark owner, have to prove that the trademark is used, you know. So the uh, the the trademark owner is the one who who has the burden of proof that the trademark is used, and the other party doesn't have to do nothing. Uh, when you filing the cancellation motion, you don't have to make any research or justification. It is enough just to file such motion. And the second possibility to uh, to file the cancellation motion due to non-use is the court proceeding. For example, if you've got the uh, claims referring to trademark infringement and the claims are uh, are based on a trademark, 
which can be uh, cancelled, uh, then it is enough to file a counterclaim, including such uh, such cancellation request. So there are two ways when you can uh, file this um, uh, this cancellation motion. And additionally, uh, in opposition proceeding or in cancellation proceeding, as I said before, you can ask for the proof of use. This is not a typical cancellation uh, request because uh, after examining this uh, proof of use and if the use is not proven, the trademark will not be canceled. It simply, it will be treated as non-existence existing in this very proceeding, you know, so you cannot base your claims on unused trademarks. So it is useless for, for fighting for your rights. So there are two cancellation proceedings before the office in administrative proceeding and before the court in pending uh, a civil proceeding, plus you can use this uh, proof of use procedure. Well, that's that's very interesting and very complicated as well. So if you're in Europe, uh, you have different avenues to try to uh, enforce the, the use of the trademark against someone trying to challenge your application. So the, and it's probably very useful to applicants as well. And perhaps it, it, it matches the very purpose of a trademark is that is being in the market, uh, identifying goods and services and actually helping consumers to choose their goods and services and avoiding confusion. So if it's not doing that, what's the purpose of it even existing? And avoiding third parties from actually trying to use something that it might be uh, similar. So, but uh, another issue that comes up when, it, when we talk about uh, use it, and and particularly proof of use is the amount of these uh, of the pieces of evidence that need to be uh, submitted. And this was a quite big change here in Brazil with the regulation that was implemented last year because uh, we changed from a very lenient uh, approach. The BPTO would often uh, accept any little amount that would evidence that, well, the the registrant used the mark at some point and it some of the goods were sold and that's fine i don't want to look at it very deeply but right now when the office starts to actually requiring effective use throughout the 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 five year period they start looking deeper into the evidence that is being submitted and the amount of it sometimes uh, is a very uh, important aspect. Uh, according to current regulation, there is no fixed amount. It will depend on on the on the field of business and other circumstances. These circumstances are not very clear in the regulation, but I would guess that they would also depend, of course, on the size of the company. And we do have a precedent on that from our Superior Court of Justice. Saying uh, and the case was some was uh, relating to cigarettes and the uh, registrant there was there was having their trademark cancel was a very very large multinational company which only which was only able to submit a few hundred uh, uh, packs of cigarettes being uh, sold in the entire five year period and the court say. Okay, you are very large. It makes no commercial sense to sell only 100 or a couple of hundred uh, cigarettes packed. So it's not uh, sufficient evidence of uh, proof of use. Uh, but then, what happens in Europe, Claudia? Do you have when it comes to the minimum amount? How is it uh, reviewed by your uh, your local authorities? You know, there is no one size fits all rule regarding the standard amount uh, and amount of evidence, you know, that you should sub submit to prove that genuine use. Uh, first of all, you have to prove that uh, your use is not token, so that your aim is to enter the market or to keep the market. This is very important, you know. 
and the evidence should uh, uh, relate to the trademark and to the goods and services covered with trademark. This is a crucial thing. And they should, of course, uh, refer to the period we are arguing about, and it should refer to the relevant territory. And this territory, as you know, the European Union, uh, uh, it's, not one, it's not one country. There are several countries. So there is always a question, is it enough to use in one country, for example, just in Poland, or maybe you should use in number of countries. So this is always an issue. So uh, there is a very, um, a very well known O'Neill case where the court said that uh, the, Un the European Union is one market, so we cannot refer to the countries. But in practice, you know, you should prove uh, that the market that you are using this trademark, even if it's a small market, is very important for you. For example, in one of the cases, it was enough to prove the use of the some IT services uh, in the area of Thames River next to London. You know, just such a small area was enough to, to prove. Uh, so, uh, so this territory is quite uh, relevant. Um, and about the numbers, it refers, uh, it depends on the market we are referring to. Sometimes uh, you said about this tobacco producer. If it's a big tobacco producer uh, pro and, and cigarettes are quite commonly used, so probably we would require more, bigger amounts, uh, you know, or, or bigger invoices uh, to be introduced to the market. That's, or, or maybe some kind of marketing as well. But uh, when we refer to the small companies that, for example, are uh, producing just very specific goods, uh, like, for example, some veterinary stuff or some uh, special nutrition for, uh, for soil, there were some cases like this. It was enough that uh, that the small amounts were introduced to the markets. So it, it really, really depends. Uh, but the, the very important thing is that uh, the evidence you present uh, must, uh, as I said before, must show that it is that the use is not just for keeping the trademark alive and not really using trademark on the market. So I, I think that this is uh, this is why one of the most uh, uh, important thing to prove. But there is no one rule how to prove it and which amount are you know required. Thank you, Claudia. This is this is very interesting. Very I think interesting. when it comes. When it comes to our uh, three uh, jurisdictions, we have a, a large territory for all of us. So it's Europe, Brazil, and China. And at least here in Brazil, it doesn't matter if you're a small bakery or, uh, or if you're a large uh, producer of beer uh, distributed worldwide, you can have a trademark registration. And of course, the amount of use will be different uh, from, uh, from the requirements from each of these companies. So I'm very interested to learn what happens in uh, China as well. But just before uh, 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 I, I, uh, I pass the word to you, Lena, I just want to let the audience know that this is a round table. So if you want to make any questions, please, you're free to do that. And we'll be more than happy to answer and, and read your comments as well. And, and once again, thank you so much for joining us here today. But Lina, what happens in China when it comes to amount, when it comes to uh, uh, use throughout the territory, uh, well, either if you're a small bakery or if you produce all the bread in China? <laughs> Right. Well, China uh, is one country, not like European Union has 20 plus countries, but we do have like 31 provinces in China mainland. So the situation um, uh, probably similar to multiple uh, nation uh, body territories. Uh, but I think the rules in this uh, regards uh, relating to this question are, are more or less the same or 
or maybe similar, if I put this way. So in China, also, there is no uh, explicit uh, provisions on the amount of uh, uh, evidence required or the minimum amount of evidence in proving a uh, trademark use. It is uh, really a case by case judgment. And industry from industry and uh, um, uh, company from company, so really very case by case uh, issue. But the basic rule is that you need to be really genuine use. Your use is, uh, is really to uh, to make a commercial use, it's not a token use. I think the examiners and judges are very smart in this regard to tell in most of the cases. So they can tell which ones are like a created uh, a token use just in order to maintain the trademark. Some probably, although in very little amount of uh, evidence or sales still can maintain the, the, the uh, trademark, uh, the trademark registration. So the examiner will ju and judge will uh, uh, make assessment in consideration of the, the uh, different factors, including like uh, which industry it is, uh, what kind of business models in this industry uh, uh, running, and also the marketing or the business customs, etc. So with all the uh, uh, consideration of all these uh, factors, the conclusion will be made after the overall uh, assessment. Uh, we, but but, but, but uh, uh, similar to uh, to uh, Claudia's case, if you are with too little evidence, it is likely to be decided as uh, a token use or or symbolic use, which will not be sufficient to maintain the registration. Uh, in one case, uh, the concern trademark was uh, registering class 25 or the clothing uh, products. And the registrant submitted a perfect uh, evidence train, including uh, the contract, the invoices, uh, the picture of the products, etc. So with this evidence train, it's complete to prove time, all the elements they need to, to uh, prove. But uh, eventually, the, the examiner uh, decided that it is too little. And in the clothing industry, within several years, you only have one sale. It's really abnormal for such an industry. And it's not uh, uh, make a, a, a successful or, or even not a, a normal business. In such a case, such a use is uh, was determined as a token or symbolic use, so the trademark was was cancelled. But if in another uh, situation, for instance, the, the product is very high value or very precious, and the, uh, the business uh, or the consumer's needs is not uh, high at all. So to sell, to sell like one, one time a year, probably can feed the, uh, the trademark owner the whole year. In such a case, it will be sufficient if it's only one cell. So it really depends on the, the industry. And then regarding the evidence uh, 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 chain, I mean, uh, it's not, we need to prove several uh, factor, facts to in, in with the evidence, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, it is to prove who, uh, when and where used uh, which trademark on what goods or services, only to prove all these uh, information, these facts, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence can be accepted as valid or as sufficient, but uh, it's not necessary to uh, include all the information, one single evidence. So as long as the evidence train as a whole can prove uh, the, the use period, which mark, uh, who are using, and on what goods, then it could be uh, taken as valid and sufficient trademark. When regarding back to the to the amount of evidence, I should point out that uh, uh, in, in some of uh, the use are, are definitely not enough. 
first uh, just to publish the trademark information or the registration or ownership um, over the trademark, it's not enough. Uh, the second situation is to use the mark in a, a non-public domain is not sufficient. It's, it won't be regarded as commercial uh, uh, use, such as to, to use uh, internally in the office, but not to sell to the consumers. Or you produce it, but uh, did not put uh, the products into the market. Uh, such use are all taken as internal use, so it won't be sufficient. And the third, uh, just to provide a, a trademark license agreement, but without any uh, actual use evidence, it won't uh, be sufficient. So these are also not sufficient uh, use case. Uh, well, uh, regarding who can use, I, I think uh, according to the submission by different national groups when answering the study questions, uh, it turns out that in most jurisdictions, uh, the user can be the registrants, can be the licensee, can also be other authorized parties in China the same. So here, uh, uh, think regarding the, the person, uh, it's not uh, strict. So even uh, the unauthorized party who used the trauma, but afterwards was uh, approved or uh, or agreed by the uh, trademark owner, it will be fine. May I use something here? Yes. Yeah, may, may I add something here? This is very interesting. The last issue you said that unauthorized use shall be also treated as genuine use. So this is different in Europe, you know? Mm -hmm. If this is unauthorized use, uh, it will not be used as the genuine use because it was not the intention of the trademark owner that this trademark is used on the market or on this relevant territory. So this is uh, this is really interesting and this is an uh, important difference, I think, to remember to all of us who want to prove the, uh, the, the genuine use in China. Because for, in my mind, it would be impossible, you know, I would never thought about sending you this kind of evidence. So it's very interesting thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in some cases, we could not find the direct uh, use evidence by the, the owner or by the license part, but third party may uh, uh, do that without uh, awareness of the trademark registration. For instance, some media, some uh, uh, influential, the, 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 what's the word for that? Those uh, celebrities or on the internet yeah. who sell the product without, yeah, yeah, influencers. They introduce the product into China, and then we took the these evidence as um, submitted with the office, and they they were accepted in some cases. Of course, it's case by case, but it's very likely to be accepted. I think this is very interesting, and I think it addresses Suzanne Finkelberg's uh, question when it comes to what type of evidence. And, and regarding this uh, authorization or lack of authorization, it's also a little bit different in Brazil, because uh, uh, here the PPTO sometimes even requires some sort of written authorization if the evidence of use refers to a third party's use. But then, uh, and as you were talking, I was starting to think about those uh, sort of uses that uh, uh, the owner of a trademark cannot uh, take out for bed. For instance, the use, uh, the referential use of a trademark or uh, using relating to spare parts. And if they are uh, obliged to uh, and required to accept such use, why can't they use it on their own behalf? So that's something that we could think about. And particularly when it comes to the uh, aspect that uh, one of the uh, targets of trademark protection is also protecting consumers. So if the trademark uh, is being used in the marketplace and the consumer is being able to 
actually understand uh, that this is a trademark originating from some sort of source, uh, if a third party will, uh, will be able to get a registration just because the owner was not able to clearly evidence use, even though the mark was being used uh, effectively in the marketplace, that could hurt the consumers in some way. So that's, I'll have to think about it a little bit better, and but it's 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 kind of interesting, and I don't think this was addressed by the resolution of the API. So perhaps you're gonna need a new resolution on this one. Um, but uh, one quick question still on Suzanne's uh, question: uh, What about publicity material? Is it considered sufficient, or does it need to come? with uh, effective sales or effective agreements? Uh, how does it work uh, in Europe and China? Maybe you can start with Europe. Uh, publicity, material, and advertisement. Is it enough? It just advertisement and just marketing uh, materials. You are asking always not obvious questions, you know? <laughs> because this is always uh, always disputable issue. In general, in the European Union, the advertisement and, uh, and marketing may be treated as, uh, as a genuine use uh, evidence, but in most cases, it will be just supportive. Uh, evidence, you know, there is a big discussion uh, in doctrine, uh, if it's possible, uh, because when you use the trademark, you have to use it in a, it is pre primary function, which is the origin, you know, show, showing the origin and giving the, the consumer the origin of the goods. And marketing function is something else. So there's a big discussion if, uh, if this marketing without uh, entering the goods to the market or services to the market, if it's enough. And you can find verdicts and decisions that the courts will say, yes, it's enough. But for example, in Poland, uh, you can say, you can find, more, find mostly the decision that it's not enough to find just the marketing materials. As a general rule, the means of evidence, you can present everything. Yes, of course, the most valuable one are invoices because it's always uh, uh, the, the strongest evidence. Invoices, offers, packaging, labels, uh, price lists, catalogs, photograph, press advertisements. Um, you, can, uh, you can file affidavits. Uh, and even you can witness, you can have witnesses, you know, as uh, uh, as an evidence. But it is not very popular uh, before European bodies to to uh, to listen the the witness. So if you file the marketing materials plus all the other evidence or supported by some invoices, it might be enough. But if it's just marketing materials. And there is no proof that the goods are or, or services are on the market. I think it might not be enough. Thanks. And what about China, Lena? Well, in China, um, uh, advertisement is a way of using the trademark. Uh, well, uh, in most of cases, if you advertise it, uh, for instance, in TV show, in an exhibition, or on the internet, uh, in many cases, it can be accepted as valid use, unless it's really too symbolic. Just once a year, probably just enough to maintain, uh, then which will be taken as token uh, uh, use. Other than that, uh, generally speaking, it can be sufficient to maintain the trademark. I think the rationale uh, behind it is uh, you don't need to be successful in business. You advertise it, you try hard to sell, but at the end, you did not make it. It's still allowed. <laughs> so um, at, if you can provide the, uh, those marketing materials and also to prove that uh, uh, such materials are actually uh, uh, be sent to or they reached the consumers or potential consumers 
uh, it is uh, likely or very likely to be accepted in, in such a case. So marketing materials, advertisement materials are uh, valid. One of the uh, valid, uh, I mean, uh, evidence in China acceptable. Of course, there are exceptions, but uh, uh, generally speaking, yes. Great, and there's another very good question here from Anna Hackers about uh, what what happens when the good is given out for free. And we did have a case here in Brazil a few years ago. Uh, it's uh, the manufacturer of computers and software, and they actually changed the market a couple of decades ago when they decided to offer their operational systems for free. So you could. Uh, just keep downloading the new versions and each new version would have a new name and then a new trademark. But so at some point we had to have them use of it. And the, and the Brazilian trademark office actually accepted uh, the download links and evidence that, it, that the software was embedded in some of the products. And that happens when, when uh, the, consume, the, the device uh, already has some of these uh, softwares and the links for downloading uh, and updating the operational system. And uh, I don't know any case of it, but perhaps with uh, free applications for, for cell phones, for instance, it might be the same. Uh, I don't know what happens right now, what's going to happen with the, with the current regulation on the BPTO because now they adopt a more stringent standard but if it's there, it's in the marketplace, a consumer can have access to it, why not? I don't know if you have any case uh, law on that, Lina or Claudia, that you wanted to share, but I think it's, as Lina said, it, it, it all comes down to the rationale uh, behind it. Right. Um, well, in China, um, uh, to have a giveaway of free products to to be given to the consumers together with the other services or other uh, goods uh, can be a way of use uh, in many cases. Uh, there are different uh, conclusions in different cases, but uh, we saw in some cases, at least uh, the judges and the examiners do accept that. I, I think uh, uh, it is reasonable to uh, to, uh, deter, to to accept such a way of use because although it's free, you looks it looks like free, but it's not really free. It either go with the other sell the products or other sell the services or serve uh, the the uh, overall business uh, advertisement of the the registrants. So I don't think it's really free. Uh, even if it is free, it's still a use. It's it does not say that you have to. Um, exchange it with the money or with uh, a price. So I, I, I do believe uh, the giveaway products or, or giveaway services uh, can be uh, a use uh, to maintain a trademark registration as well. Yes, so the same is in Europe. You know, in 2008, we had the very famous Radetzky case. And it referred to the charity organization and they registered a trademark and were using this trademark, but just on the festins, just to market their uh, promotional materials, uh, just as an emblem. And there was a question, is it, is it the genuine use of the trademark, you know? And the general court said that uh, these non-profit organizations, they can register a trademark, of course, and it is obvious that they are not doing it for money, so they will not sell anything, they will not earn money on using these trademarks. And the genius of the trademarks doesn't have to be connected with earning money. You know, they can be competitor on the market and they may fight, for example, for the members. They may have another profit from using these trademarks. And uh, that's why you, even mm. if you use the, the trademark for the free products, it doesn't mean that it cannot be genuine use. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lynette, for your, about this one. I, I agree completely and think that would also apply to Brazil. Uh, but there's another very sensitive aspect that has changed here in Brazilian law, which comes, uh, which refers to uh, a change in the trademark itself from the mark that is that has been featured in the in the certificate of registration. Uh, and when you try to evidence use of that mark, you only have some sort of new. A uh, newly designed uh, mark, a mark that has been used with some small changes, sometimes big changes, a different color, a different letter font. In the past, Brazilian office was very, very strict about it. If it didn't, if the mark being in use did not match exactly the mark showing in the certificate of registration, the mark would get cancelled. But in this in this latest regulation, they changed it a little bit, saying if the changes do not affect the overall appearance of the mark, the distinctive nature of the mark, then it's going to be accepted. Here in Brazil, you cannot amend the registration. It's going to still be the same way that it was applied for, but the change that use will be accepted as evidence of use of the mark as registered. So, uh, Lina, uh, how does it happen in China? Well, in China also, uh, once the trademark is filed, you can't change it at all, unless requested by the examiner. For instance, you put an R there, which should not be part of the trademark, then the examiner probably will ask you to remove it. If not requested by the examiner, you won't be able, you are not allowed to change anything after filing. So uh, it happens often. The actual user trademark is different from the registered trademark. Uh, just as the resolution of the ARPPI uh, uh, concluded that uh, uh, as long as the distinctive uh, character of the trademark not altered, then it should be taken as valid uh, use. It should be tolerated. In China, we uh, follow this rule. But the question is, how different is different? So th this is a difficult uh, 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 judgment. And also, it's a very case-by-case -case, uh, uh, judgment. Uh, we may, uh, I, I want to show you some examples so that you will uh, have a more direct idea how in China we assess uh, the, uh, the, the, what is unaltered trademark. So let me try to share, uh, oh, not this one, <laughs> different one. All right. Can you see now? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Great. So let's see. Well, uh, here I make some summary of the generals on whether a distinctive uh, a, a a character of mark is altered or, or, or not. So in general scenarios, uh, well, there are some uh, uh, common scenarios that where the examiner or the uh, court will, will think there is no uh, substantive change or the distinctive character of the mark is not altered. So the first one is to change the positions of the composite element. For instance, to change the up-down uh, arrangement to left-right arrangement, you will see some case uh, uh, later. And the second is to use one distinctive part of a combined uh, uh, mark. Uh, for this one, uh, there is a bit of debate. But in some cases, we do see that the trademark office maintain the, uh, the registration in such a case. And the third one is to use color for the black and white uh, mark. 
And the fourth one is to use the mark together with other marks. That means that on, on the same product, you will see multiple marks. It's not, it, it's also allowed. And uh, the next one is to omit or add the non-distinctive elements. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, in almost all the, the situations, uh, such a, a change is accepted. And uh, the next one is to change the font or the size of the letters or the characters in the in the trademark. And in some other uh, situations, uh, the, the judge or the examiner will consider uh, the business customs uh, to decide, although uh, there is some change in actual use, but uh, such a change is very commonly seen in the business, in the industry. Uh, so they are accepted, for instance, uh, for the service marks, if uh, the trademark owner use on the side sign a bone or on the gate on on the door of the shop, uh, they will make some uh, change uh, to their uh, to to their trademarks due to the uh, the, the condition. Uh, uh, such a change normally acceptable, and in some other. Uh, situations uh, like the marks with devices, uh, then when the, the, the parties mention the trademark in the contract, in the invoices, it's very often that they will omit the, the device part or use the uh, some words to describe uh, the device um, part. Then it is also uh, allowed. Uh, uh, but in China, there is one special uh, exception uh, for, for, for this uh, rule, which is probably different from uh, Europe and maybe Brazil, Brazilian as well, which needs to be confirmed by Rafael. That is, if the used trademark itself is a registered trademark, then the trademark office will cancel uh, the, the contested trademark. They, they think it's not necessary to maintain both. Since you only use one of them, why we should maintain, uh, keep both the trademarks for you? So in such a case, probably to register more trademarks is not always a benefit uh, to the registrants. Now let's look at some examples. The first group is to use the Chinese characters part only for a combined mark. You see the two register marks are both combined marks with the Chinese characters and the uh, uh, English words or Latin letters and uh, the other even with the logo, but uh, the actual used one is only the Chinese characters. Uh, they were accepted in the, in, in the final uh, decision. Although you, you, you see, uh, in before the trademark office in the cancellation review case, uh, they thought uh, it's not uh, uh, sufficient. It altered uh, the distinctive character, but uh, finally the court decided that uh, it does not uh, change the distinctive part. So they maintained the, the registration. Uh, these are the, the uh, one group of the cases, the other, the second group is to combine with another trademark. I think this is easy to understand and also re more reasonable to maintain uh, since the register mark still can be separated or easily uh, seen uh, in the actual uh, used mark, like WSB is still there as WSB, although uh, there are some other parts in the front. And uh, uh, the logo uh, plus the boy uh, a word, but the logo can still be seen and uh, uh, distinguished. So in uh, these cases, they are also maintained and accepted as valid use of the registry mark. The second one, the, the third group is to add non-distinctive elements. But uh, here, uh, uh, the the use the trademark or Chinese character trademark, but uh, let me uh, make some uh, Chinese lesson here. Uh, the last character for the first trademark is Wang, which means network or internet. Uh, 
uh, or, uh, or just net. These three markets registering class 42, uh, this character is deemed as non-distinctive. So to add this character, uh, the, the, the judge thought does not change the uh, distinctive part of the of the, the trademark, although the trademark is a combined Chinese character and uh, the Latin letter trademark. So it, eventually it uh, is maintained, the registered trademark. But the second case has a different uh, uh, or the opposite uh, fight because in the second in case, uh, the trademark office thought is value use. It should uh, be sufficient to maintain the registration, but uh, the court ruled that uh, it's not. The reasoning of the court is 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 that the registered trademark is is uh, there are two characters, although with design, uh, the two characters means nature, but with the designs nature, the word is very is not very distinctive in class five. But it is registered because it has very uh, special designs. And then the actual use trademark is yi, which means natural drink. So there is one uh, character uh, more than the, the, the word uh, of the registered trademark. Uh, the court explained that, uh, first of all, the design is totally different because the actual use one is just a few uh, normal character, uh, but uh, the, the registered one with special design. And second, natural drinks and the nature, the meaning are different. So the court did not accept uh, uh, the altered use as, uh, as a sufficient or valid use of the registered one. So these these are different uh, uh, conclusions with a similar uh, use, and uh, the fourth one I think uh, without a uh, uh, challenge, first to change position of the the composite trademarks, so all the tribunals agree that it's valid use. They only change the the up uh, low uh, uh, arrangement into left and right. And the, the last one is exactly the one I mentioned, especially that if we, the use trademark itself is a registered trademark, then the challenger trademark will be canceled. Like in this case, uh, the, the actual use trademark is another registered trademark by the same registrant. And then the first uh, one, uh, the, the, the challenger one was eventually uh, be in, be be cancelled. So uh, with all these rules, I will just just want to give you a a, a very a quick overview of different situations where the trademarks can be uh, whether they are uh, uh, substantially different from the register or not. Thank you, Lena. This is very interesting and very difficult as well. So if I'm having an issue in China, I really need a Chinese <laughs> attorney to tell the difference between what's valid and what's not, particularly with the Chinese characters. And and Claudia, what about Europe? How does it work there? Yes, you know, in Europe, we have special regulation that says that use of a trademark in a form differing in elements which don't alert the, the, the distinctive character of the trademark uh, it is still the use of the trademark and it is put in the regulation and it is quite clear. And I think it's good regulation because law must go in a line with the business. And when we see now everything, it's going to be simplified, you know, uh, all this complicated logo now, they are going to be simple because people are using them on small uh, uh, iPhones or yet they, they are looking then on a small surfaces. So everything must be, uh, must be easier and smaller. And that's why I think it's good to have such a regulation. This issue was a big issue in Europe um, in 2015. Uh, and uh, the European Union is such an institution that we are trying to work on common practice. 
and EYPO is organizing such working groups and there are different topics co uh, connected with trademarks and issues from the regulations. And one of these topics were the how different is different, yes? So what kind of, uh, uh, of authorization of the trademark uh, may keep the trademark still alive? And I will share with you some, uh, some I don't know if you can see the, the document with fishes, yes? So yes. Uh, these are the principles of this common practice. And the first thing is that, uh, first of all, you have to assess the trademark as it is registered, and you should take into account its distinctive and visual dominant elements. And the next step is that you should assess whether those elements, which, were, which are distinctive on the registered trademarks, are present or modified in the trademark as used. And you should do it side by side, you know, you should look at these two signs and, and decide. So I will go quickly now for, for through the examples that are in this common practice, because I think it's nice illustration for, for the topic we are discussing. So first of all, when you look on this first fishes, on the left, you've got the trademark as it was registered. On the right, you have trademark as it was used. So when you add this blue fish, which is dominant to the red fish, and you can barely see this red fish, you know, so this will be the alternation. And this alternation cannot be accepted. But if you have a distinctive word element and you add the also distinctive fish, but they are still in the same position in the trademark. They are both, they have the same dominant position. So this might be accepted. And next we will go to the addition of non-distinctive elements or elements of low distinctive character. So here we have the trademark Garivan. If you add non-distinctive oval element or non-distinctive word element as bio, this still be the use of the trademark. But if you have a trademark flavor and aroma for class 31, which is weak, and when you add banana to this trademark, and when you see that you cannot find this floor and aroma, so probably it will be judged that this kind of addition, it's an alternation of distinctive uh, character of the trademark as registered. So probably it will not be accepted. And considering the omissions, if you, uh, if you delete the descriptive element bio, as in this uh, uh, down uh, example here, it still be, uh, it still be good example to say that there is no alternation of distinctive character. But if in this uh, example, you have two distinctive words, Gariven and bubble cat, and you get rid of one of them, probably it will alternate the distinctive character of this uh, trademark. But if this bubble cat is written in a very illegible way and you get rid of this, probably that it will have no impact on the trademark as it was registered. So probably it will be accepted. Uh, and the same with uh, uh, with this uh, Gary Van and with this non-distinctive element. When we go to the word trademarks, you know, when you've got the word trademark, it doesn't matter about what font, what color, size, and position you will put it. It uh, it is always uh, will keep its uh, distinctive character, and it will have no impact on the distinctive character. There is one. Uh, example that can be shown as alternation of this when you cannot read the word because it is written in such a form that you cannot um, and that you cannot ident identify this word. So this will be uh, the alertation of the distinctive character. With the uh, purely figurative trademarks, if the I think that this banana is a very good example for this case. 
if you have a trademark uh, in a very simple um, shape of banana or goose in class 31, if it's registered in purple, I think that this purple color is something which is distinctive because banana for fruits is not distinctive at all. So this kind of uh, color is something dominant and distinctive. Well, if you are using just yellow banana, you are not using this dominant element of the trademark, which is this color. So as a matter of that, it will be the alternation of the distinctive character of this trademark as registered. And with this uh, composite trademarks, we have already discussed it, that it, uh, where, when, when it refers to the verbal elements, uh, use of those ele elements in different uh, color, in different form, size, will not normally alter the distinctive char character unless you have this illegible word that you don't know what, what, what is the word, if it's the same word as a trademark. And with the composite trademarks with figurative elements, you know, the modification uh, of these uh, elements when we have these two mountains and we just switch left to right, right to left, there will be no difference, you know, between these trademarks. But when we change the shape of the amount, as it's in the bottom example, and we leave just this descriptive element, best quality, uh, there will be a big difference and it will alert the distinctive uh, character of the, of the trademark. And it's very a uh, nice uh, case here with this bubble catch. In, in this trademark, when you can see here, the very distinctive and dominant is the font and the, the shape of this, uh, of this word. So if you have such fantasy um, logo and you are just using the normal you know font the very very um, regular font the, uh, the, the 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 dominant element which is this graphic presentation is missing so you cannot read this trademark so it will be alertation uh, of the distinctive character and very one important uh, important comment, which should be done at the beginning, you know, that the trademarks, the, 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 the two registered trademarks that are used together, we never consider it as using the trademarks in a form different than registered, you know? It is always the use of two separate trademarks. So we don't use this kind of examination for for two trademarks which are registered uh, separately. So I think it's quite different that it is in China. And uh, yeah, so it was very, very quick review, but I know that we are short with time. So I'm, I am stop sharing it. But as I said, this is very good. Uh, yeah, this is very good regulation. If you are interested, you should uh, review this CP8 common practice. And there is a plenty of trademarks to be to be to read and examined. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I think uh, and reviewing and watching your presentation, I think uh, uh, Brazilian practice is becoming quite similar to the European one. Uh, we also have some examples, much <laughs> much much less examples, but still some examples are very similar to those used in Europe here by the new regulation. And Lina, the, the point that you raised on, well, if you already have a registration for that one, it cannot be, it will, won't be sufficient to show use uh, with a different trademark registration. We still didn't get to that particular place in Brazil. I think that question was never raised. I don't know what the answer would be here, but uh, it makes some sense. If, if you already have the registration for that type of use, why do you need another one, uh, another registration to be maintained? But at the end of the day, I think uh, in all our uh, jurisdictions, one thing that uh, one, one aspect behind of it is how the consumer sees it and is it sufficient for the consumer to understand this is the same trademark and this is the same source, this is the same origin 
And does it work as a trademark to protect the, the producer, but also to protect the consumer? I think these aspects are always questions to be asked. Uh, and well, we are indeed uh, almost out of time. So perhaps one just one final quick question is when it comes to online news, uh, what we do we do there? How to evidence use uh, when the use is online? Because sometimes it's difficult to get dates. It's difficult to 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 see that there's there's not there has not been any changes since the publication. Um, here in Brazil, it was the first time that online use was discussed when we they the BPTO implemented that one. But it's still it has not been fully tested by our courts. So I don't know, uh, Claudia, if you have any comments when it comes to Europe. Uh, that would be great to be shared with the, particularly with the Brazilian audience here today. Yes, of course. You know, the use of a trademark on the internet or on the website could uh, constitute a genuine use. There are no special regulation on that. The same principles apply to internet use as to the offline use. Um, and what is very important that uh, the use should be targeted to the recipients within the relevant territory. So the use should be addressed to the recipients in the um, in the euro in Europe. So uh, what we should prove, we should prove that there is a sale of goods uh, um, or, or the or the provision of services made to the EU consumer. Uh, we should prove that this this website is uh, in uh, one of the EU languages, that the, the goods are offered and sold in EU currencies, uh, that there is, uh, for example, a hot head office of, uh, of the trademark owner somewhere in Europe. Maybe they have some kind of service center in Europe that European consumers can contact them. Uh, what else? Uh, maybe there is some local telephone number, maybe some local address provided on this website. Uh, so, and the, and the, the, I think that very important thing would be that the, the trademark owner runs a business in Europe, so in one of the European countries. So I think that it would be very, uh, very important. And very important thing is that the use of the trademarks needs to be related to the goods already market or just about to be market, um, uh, because it means that the, that these goods uh, are are present and are uh, that the EU consumer is uh, familiar with them. Uh, the internet materials and sources could be accepted as evidence of use of the trademark. Uh, the catalog of, of this evidence, as I said, is open, so you can present also the materials from internet. We have another common practice, as I said, we Europeans are good in common practices. This one is CP12, and this is the common practice on evidence in trademark appeal proceedings, but it is commonly used uh, by EU IPO and EU member states offices as well. And this document specifies the practice, especially in uh, in regarding to filing the evidence. So, so I think it's good if you need some advice, you can you can look to this uh, to this practice. And one more very interesting case for me, it was really interesting, and I think that for my European colleagues as well, it referred. It's the standard international management case. It was issued, I think, last year, uh, and. Uh, the case uh, referred to the hotel services and the hotel services were offered in US, so outside Europe, but it was advertised in Europe, you know, and the advertisement was uh, directed to the European consumer. And the court said that in some specific circumstances, use of the trademark can be considered as a genuine use uh, when it relates to advertised services where advertisement and offers are aimed to the consumer in Europe, but the service as such are only available abroad. So it was very interesting uh, case with very interesting verdict, uh, very non-common, you know, uh, 
and uh, it refers both to the offering services online and to the advertisement, as we said before, you know. So as I said, that, that these goods should be should be on the market, but it should in general be an EU market. But with this judgment, you can say it's enough to advertise, online advertise, and use uh, the trademark for the services outside EU. So I think it's quite interesting. And due to the time, I will put full stop here. Thank you, Claudia. And this is really, really an interesting uh, case. And Lina, uh, you mentioned influencers and social media. So how does it work in China? <laughs> right. Uh, well, the online use uh, can be accepted as valid use for, for sure, but it needs to meet certain criteria. Uh, uh, the criteria actually generally speaking the same as the assessment of offline use. And it's also a case-by-case uh, case assessment. Uh, similarly, as the offline uh, use proving, the registration should prove when and where, who used the trademark on what goods and services. So uh, I think for the online uh, use, the territory, I mean, the use territory assessment is probably the most challenging one, since there is no physical boundary for the internet, for the, for the virtual world especially, and the different factors should be considered. Uh, normally what will be considered include uh, like the accessibility of the internet, or of the uh, web page, or of the app by the consumers in China, whether the actual uh, shipment of goods happened, I mean, into China happened, and uh, 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 like the currencies or languages adopted on on the web on the website or on on the virtual uh, apps. So uh, uh, the assessment will uh, be made uh, after considering all the different factors uh, in in this regard. But for the evidence, uh, if you download a web page. Uh, then the difficult part is the, the time proving when such, a, 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 for instance, offer for sale uh, happened, uh, you need to prove uh, th this is also difficult. So uh, nowadays, some of our clients, that what they do is to do the evidence uh, preservation from time to time and keep them in the dossier. Uh, so that when they need it, they can use it. And nowadays, with uh, 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 like blockchain or other uh, tools, uh, the, such uh, evidence preservation become uh, very cheap and reasonably affordable for most of the trademark owners, and also simple and easy. So it's advisable to main, to to keep uh, collect evidence and keep evidence from time to time, just in case you need them one day to prove the actual use. Thank you, Lina. Just in case is always what lawyers say. So uh, this is very good advice. And well, I think we're out of time, right, Patricia? Thank you so much. Before I, 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 I give the floor to you, Patricia, I'd like to really thank Lina and Claudia uh, for joining us today here. It was amazing. Yeah, and that's why I always say you are IP stars. We can ask any questions and you know it. So thank you so much. And a, a, a last announcement for any AIPPI member here. I just heard that the questions for 2025, the, the Jap in, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Japan Congress, uh, will be released today, so you can uh, all the delegates can vote on what the questions uh, will be discussed. And before that, uh, I hope that any APPI member here will join us in Hangzhou, right, Lina? Uh, yes. So that I we hope can come. please come. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll see you in Hangzhou and discuss a little bit further. Thank you, Patricia. It's it's yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I would like to thank you, Lena and Claudia, for all the knowledge you share with us today. Uh, and thank you, the audience, for the participation. 
And I would also like to invite the audience and you, Lena, Claudia, Rafael, to follow the Dunman Simpson Institute on our social media and website to, to follow the news. Uh, for example, in June, we will have another Agenda IDS, this time on strategic litigation management. Uh, so stay tuned to all the, the, the new projects we are preparing for you. Uh, and it's all. Thank you and see you soon.